true murder is a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with yes. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker. BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. Chris Thomas is not yet 30 years old when he finds himself managing the immense pressure, eccentric personalities, and extenuating circumstances of an international story where one small misstep could adversely impact the search for a missing teenager and the reputation of her family. Now, 20 years later, Thomas takes readers behind the scenes, providing new details, perspectives, and commentary on finding Elizabeth Smart. In the process of reflecting on Elizabeth's search and rescue, Thomas discovers how growing up in the culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as Mormon, helped push him to develop the exact kind of intuition needed to manage Elizabeth's kidnapping and rescue, and do so while the world watched. Unexpected juxtaposes crucial events from the Smart case with Thomas's experience growing up in the Latter-day Saint culture, including coming to understand the secret of a broken war hero before it was too late. The book that we're featuring this evening is Unexpected, the backstory of finding Elizabeth Smart and growing up in the culture of an American religion. With my special guest, author, speaker, and communications professional, Chris Thomas. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Chris Thomas. Thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure being on. Thank you so much, and congratulations on this extraordinary book. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite the journey, and, and it's always, you know, for me, this was a first, and, and seeing it come to life has been a real thrill. Let's talk about this extraordinary book project. With this book, you have the foreword written by Elizabeth Smart herself. It's somewhat brief, but she writes that uh, when she was abducted in 2002, she didn't believe she'd live another year, let alone 20. And she spent countless hours in imagining what it would be like to be rescued and how it would happen and what it would be like to reunite with her family. When it finally did happen, a whirlwind of names, places, and many feelings regarding this unknown, only a few people stood out in her memory from shortly after, and one of those people was you. Tell us about where you were, what position you were in, what was your background, and how you came to be involved with the Elizabeth Smart Search and Rescue. So Elizabeth's cousin started an internship with my public relations firm a couple of weeks before the abduction. And so when Elizabeth was abducted, we volunteered to help. Initially, they said, we've got it. Elizabeth's uncle is a photojournalist, so he had some media savvy. But as the media contingent swelled, they welcomed our help. And, and we got involved thinking it would be a few days. They'd find her. We'd celebrate and go back to our day jobs. And my partners ended up going back to the agency and I stayed with the Smart family for the next nine and a half months. So, you know, long history. And I was managing the media initially, was handling all the communications efforts with, with a team. And, and then over time, grew to be a close confidant of the family and was involved in, in so much more. You take us right just again briefly to the first time you lay eyes on on Elizabeth Smart and the circumstances in which you end up being at the Smart home. Yes. Yeah, so that day of her rescue, I actually had seen Elizabeth at the police station. There had been some issues with victims' rights. John Walsh, the host of America's Most Wanted, I had reached me. We'd worked very close and I, I took his call and, and he had asked me to pass on some information about how Elizabeth should be treated. And, and they were doing the exact opposite. And when Ed Smart learned that, you know, they were violating her victims' rights, he became very upset to the point where he had to be restrained. And I was called down to the police station. So the first time I saw Elizabeth was when I got out of the elevator and she was coming out of an interrogation room. I, I didn't say anything to her at that point. I felt it just wasn't appropriate to talk to somebody who'd been in captivity just a few hours earlier. 
But later that night, when I went up to the house to touch base and plan for media for the following day, as I approached the doorstep, Elizabeth and her siblings were in the background and her parents were at the door talking with some neighbors. And you know, as, as I got up there, Elizabeth gave me this strange look, like, who is this? She obviously didn't recognize me from the police station. And fortunately, Ed caught that glimpse. And he said, Elizabeth, you don't know who this is. He said, this is Chris. I consider him like a brother. You should too. And I just wept. It was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. And and for that reason, I start the book with that experience and then I go back through the story, coming back to that day toward the end. Now, tell us about the conversations you have, the job that you have at this public relations company that been recently formed, not too long before this, but also tell us about who Tom Smart is and some of the concerns from the family regarding Tom Smart. So Tom Smart is Elizabeth's uncle, who's the photojournalist. And in fact, his daughter was Sierra, was the one who started the internship with my firm. And Tom has an interesting story. He is one of the most passionate, iconoclastic people I know. And after Elizabeth was abducted, Tom didn't sleep for more than 150 hours. Wow. And, and the longer he didn't sleep, the more his faculties were compromised. And as he was interfacing with the media, he started to say things that were pretty erratic. And we, we had to try to pull him away from the media. But Tom was this force throughout the book where he was doing everything he could to find Elizabeth. And, and many of the things he did were instrumental in, in her rescue. And in other places, he created some challenges as well. And, and Tom and I have an interesting interplay as trying to respond to the media and, and respond to his lack of sleep. Tell us about this board and the Smart family and the actually the, the Church of Latter-day Saints and all of the people involved in organizing and strategizing the very first steps towards the search and rescue of Elizabeth Smart. And one thing that was remarkable about the search for Elizabeth Smart is just the level of organization and detail and the resources that were available. Now, the smarts were portrayed to be very affluent, and, and they, they weren't necessarily really wealthy. They, they definitely were better off than most people. At the same time, they were very, very well connected. So Elizabeth's grandfather had been head of the National Cancer Institute and was this incredible man who actually kind of led the efforts at 76 years old. And he had done amazing service around the country. So people came out of the woodwork to help him. In addition to that, the culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is one of service. And you know we're taught from a very young age to serve others. And when there's a need, you rise to the occasion. And that first week Elizabeth was missing, more than 10,000 people came out to search for her. And to provide some context, the next closest search for a missing child in recent history was 4,000 people over several weeks. So the, the church played a, a significant role in organizing that. Now, these weren't all church members. This was very much a community effort, but was organized at, at the church and, and very much by Elizabeth's congregation. And I get into the culture of the church a little bit in the book. It's, it's not necessarily a religious book, but to understand that effort and to, and to understand a lot of what went into rescue Elizabeth, it's important to, to understand that culture. You asked about the board. So Elizabeth's aunts and uncles were all pretty esteemed people physician, a lawyer, and there were others in kind of their inner circle and a tech entrepreneur, the former mayor of Salt Lake. And they formed this group that more or less was a board. I couldn't think of a better word than a board to use for them. I don't know that it was formal, but they met together twice a day to work on the investigation and to figure out how best to assist law enforcement, to assist the search effort, and to take care of the family. And and. Very early on, I, I was introduced and, and made a member of that group, which was a little overwhelming in that I was 29 years old and had a bachelor's degree, and, and nearly everyone in there was 10, at least 10 years older than me and, and had many graduate degrees. But I learned so much from them. It was a tremendous experience. And you talk about this Elizabeth Smart search center that's set up, but also what did the family really need from you in your mind? And what did you and your team bring to them in terms of this? But also, how did you arise as a, a for better term, a leader or a spokesperson for this group? Sure. There was intense media attention. And, and, and that really is 
credit to Tom Smart, who made Elizabeth a, a household name overnight. Right. There was a lot of attention, and he really fed that and worked a lot of his media contacts around the country. Once that attention was there, it was figuring out how best to work with the media. The media is a two-edged sword. In one way, they can, can be your best friend, can really help to get the word out. And on the other, they can cut you personally pretty deep. And we had a very personal discussion with the smarts about the media early on and said, you need to understand what you're getting into because this is not going to be rosy. They are going to take shots at you. They're going to dig into your background. Are you willing to do this? And to what degree? And they said, we want to do anything it takes to find Elizabeth. We don't care what they do or say. We want to go full bore. So at that point, my team and I were really working to be as organized as possible in how we worked with the media. We were very fortunate that the extended smart family was was large and they were they were articulate and willing to do interviews. It was at that point that we were working to make sure that they were well coordinated, that they were consistent in how they were answering questions, and that we were providing the media with, you know, as much content and 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 with good commentary that would make for good stories. So really trying to manage that initially. And then as things got more pointed and more negative, it was managing those issues and crises within the, the, the abduction and the search. What was your relationship with Tom Smart and how did you manage that relationship or attempt to? So Tom was really the only person that I had known prior with him being a photojournalist. I had worked with him on a number of stories. He also, one of my business partners, he was like an uncle to him. So I knew Tom pretty well. And initially, you know, Tom and I, felt Tom and I and our team, we were just part of the team. And he was, he was kind of leading that. But as as he had to be pulled off because of his lack of sleep, changed his role a little bit. And we stepped up and, and Tom was Tom's kind of a cowboy. He is a cowboy, really loves horses and, and very much has this renegade approach to things. And so there was this amazing enthusiasm and passion and spirit with Tom. Sometimes it was just working with him to make sure that uh, we were being productive with that. And then there were challenges throughout throughout this, the, the situation where at times things got a little off the rails and, and, and we had to, to work to, to bring those back. This book, not to take it off on a tangent, but part of this story includes you growing up in the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints and how that culture shaped you with the experiences that you did have, not only with the church culture, but also this interesting and fascinating and important figure in this book named Baker. Just tell us briefly who this person is before we get back to handling this case and Tom Smart and Bill O'Reilly and Fox News. Absolutely. So Baker was one of the most unlikely teachers in my life. He was an alcoholic who lived next door to me. We had a very acrimonious relationship. He was verbally abusive. At one point, we got in a fight. He threatened to shoot me several times. And after 13 years, as I was getting ready to leave on a mission for my church, on a whim, I knocked on his door to say goodbye and spent several hours and learned his real story. And this had a profound impact on me that carried over to the smart case. I learned from him not to judge people. I still struggle with it, but, but at least to try to keep an open mind as right. it relates to what's on the surface, because it's often not what's real. And also to get thick, to have thick skin. I mean, he was about as, as harsh of an individual as you could expect. So there were several lessons there, several lessons growing up in the Latter-day Saint culture that really prepared me for that experience with the Smart Case. And so I, I go back to that as kind of a Wonder Years type of rated memoir where there's part of my childhood and then there's, there's the Smart Case specifically. Now let's get to, you're trying to handle the media. You're trying to stress that you need to have a consistent messaging, everyone, extended family included, that may be interviewed. And that is your, you are coordinating day and night from beginning, as you write in the book, from very beginning in the morning, coordinating interviews, facilitating interviews, facilitating print interviews. But tell us about Tom Smart and his own mission and what he does and how Bill O'Reilly and Fox News comes into this story. So Tom is finally Elizabeth's grandfather, Charles Smart, who's the, the patriarch. He more or less tells Tom, you're, you're going home, you're getting sleep. He sets up a rule that anyone who's going before the media must have had at least four hours of sleep the night before. And so he sends Tom off and 
That night, unbeknownst to us, Tom shows up on Larry King Live. He had somebody drive him across town to a studio. We've been doing all the interviews by satellite at the church house. And he's on with the neighborhood milkman who had seen this man, Brett Michael Edmonds, who was one of the initial suspects in the case. And during the interview, Tom, again, who is severely compromised from a lack of sleep, determines in his mind that the milkman is the actual abductor. And he tries to get him to confess to the crime live on Larry King Live. And then Tom starts saying erratic things, trying to get him to confess like the, the abductor's not a bad person, that we think he's okay. And, and so that, that was kind of the beginning of it. And after that interview, Tom was sent, I think, to a, a remote cabin with no cell service to, to get some sleep. The next day, though, he hadn't told us that he had lined up an interview with the Bill O'Reilly show and that there was a backstory to it that, that we weren't familiar with. And that was that Tom had worked with a man named Mark Kloss, whose daughter, Polly Kloss, was, was unfortunately abducted and, and, and murdered. And he had come to town under the auspices of a, a father of a missing child trying to provide his, his help and, and, and advice to the Smart family and didn't disclose initially that he was a paid Fox News consultant. And Tom set up a meeting with, with Ed and Lois Smart, Elizabeth's parents. And at the end, Fox News came in for a little exclusive part of the, of the meeting. And, and then Tom called Mark out and, and said, wait a sec, you know, who are you working for? And Mark confessed that he was working for Fox News. And, and Tom told him to stay away from the family. And so he then went to Bill O'Reilly and they made this whole fuss out of the fact that Tom was a suspicious individual and that he was trying to impede the investigation, that Mark Kloss and Bill O'Reilly wanted to bring in this famed forensic artist, Jeannie Boyland, and that Tom had, had nixed it. The only problem was Tom didn't show up to the interview the next day. He was going to take these guys head on. And the producer at the very last minute was able to convince uh, Tom's daughters, uh, his, my intern, Sierra, who was 21, and, and her younger sister, who was 18, to come on the show in Tom's stead and completely ambushed them uh, over the situation which they they weren't aware of and this this was i mean deplorable to begin with and and secondly really caused a fury with Tom when he finally came out of his uh, exile and, 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 and was, was arrested what did the police have to say and what's the media response so a couple of things happened during that time uh, around that time the Salt Lake Tribune publishes a story that citing unnamed sources that uh, a member of the extended smart family might be involved in Elizabeth's abduction. And of course, oh. le reading between the lines, it's obvious they're talking about Tom Smart. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't add up. I mean, at least from a public perspective, here he is on Larry King Live saying erratic things, then he disappears. And, and then, you know, he's called out on the O'Reilly show. And, you know, now this is happening. So Tom looks very suspicious under the circumstances. And, and you know, it, it's something that it takes some time before the media kind of lays off of Tom and, and, and the public. People aren't convinced that the family wasn't involved in some way until March 12th when Elizabeth is rescued. Now, meanwhile, the police are have the seem to have their own agenda and are not working with or working with the family necessarily and talking about a different suspect a person named Ricci tell us about this yeah so richard ricci was a handyman who had worked at the smart home for for a period of of several months he had been fired i think 6 or 8 months before elizabeth went missing and there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that pointed to him he it came out once he was arrested that he had stolen items from the smart home. He had stolen items from another neighbor's home nearby and, and had gone in the house during the middle of the night, had awakened a guest and had taken things from the house. So he looked like somebody that had the ability and, and, and knew the house and all these other details that could have come in in the middle of the night with a knife and, and taken Elizabeth. So he was arrested. There were a number of other elements that, that pointed to him being the man, and the police were absolutely convinced it was Richard Reese. Behind closed doors, they, they told the family they were 99.9999% sure it was him. Despite the fact that there were some, some very peculiar developments and questions that didn't add up with Reese being the suspect. So what is the family response to this differing of opinion? And also, what how does the public respond and the media respond to these suspicions now that are seem to be caused by Tom and his actions? 
Well, there's there's a lot of focus on on Tom and and Richard Reese tends to take some of that away when the Reese development breaks. That's after there had been a heavy focus on on Tom Smart, the National Enquirer, right before Reese is arrested as well, publishes a, a story about the Smart brothers being involved in a gay sex ring that potentially wow. led to Elizabeth's abduction. And it was so ludicrous, especially in such a conservative community like Salt Lake City that wasn't it wasn't at all believable here and even outside of Salt Lake it was so far fetched and in, in a way it did the family a favor because it kind of took the emphasis off of them a little bit just because it's gone too far and so when Reese came out that became more of the focus and then and then something peculiar happened on, on July 24th which is a statewide holiday and and there's fireworks it's just like the 4th of July everywhere else we celebrated it twice here in the state of Utah but on the 24th of July there was a break in at Elizabeth's or an attempted break in at Elizabeth's cousin's home and her mm-hmm. name was right and she was one of Elizabeth's best friends and and the irony was that it was almost identical to how the break in had occurred on the night of Elizabeth's abduction yet at this point Richard Reese was in jail so there was no way that he could have done that the police did not want the information getting out and it took about a month before it finally broke and when it did break they said they said that they had investigated it and they believed it was a teenage prank and and that was where around that time is where the family and law enforcement started to really have some differences of opinion as it related to Richard Reese and, and, and the larger case. Now, you want to keep the board's focus on finding Elizabeth and not suing Bill O'Reilly or any other thing that anyone's proposing. You want to keep that focus. So what is the strategy that you employ with the media? And what do you do to get the messaging that you want out to that public and move this case? Backing up to that point, when Tom comes back after the O'Reilly interview, which I believe was on a Friday, so it was like Monday morning, he brings an attorney with him into the board meeting. And he says, you know, we he starts handing out a press release. And he said, at the 11 o'clock briefing this morning, we're going to announce that, that we are taking legal action against Mark Kloss and Bill O'Reilly and Fox News. And the, there was just such, such a bad idea from the onset. And, and he was starting to get some traction with a few people on the board. And there was quite a bit of discussion. And I finally stood up and and wrote Elizabeth's name. There was a blackboard in the room, wrote Elizabeth's name on the blackboard and circled it and said, look, our focus is on Elizabeth and anything that doesn't help in in finding her really doesn't matter. And we need to keep our focus there. And our message was largely along those lines. It had been, but moving forward, we asked ourselves that question quite often. You know, we went back to our mission. Our mission was finding Elizabeth. Is this helping, you know, both tactically and from a message standpoint? Can you tell us about uh, Jane Clayson and her role in this story? Sure. So Jane uh, is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, had went to school at Brigham Young University here in Utah and, and started her career with KSL Television. Utah is a small, a kind of a medium market from a demographic standpoint, but we tend to have really strong broadcast journalists that come out of here and, and go national. And then this has been for some time. And so this market is one that's usually two or three rungs up. When you start out as a broadcast journalist, you usually start in a really small market. You cut your teeth there, you go to you know the next rung up. And so Jane kind of started you know, three rungs up on the ladder and quickly made a name for herself and got a a job with ABC Nightly News, and then was discovered by CBS News and became Bryant Gumbel's co-host on The Early Show. And that lasted for a couple of years. And then she was a correspondent for CBS News and for 48 hours. And she came out to cover the case for 48 hours and and formed a a close relationship with Lois Smart, who wasn't as involved with the day-to-day media, but convinced Lois to do a primetime special for 48 hours that would run in February. And this was this was like at the end of the summer. So like five months later, they were there was going to be this special that that the family was going to co- collaborate with Jane Clayson and, and CBS for, for several months on. What happens in the Reese case and him as a suspect? Sure. So there, there's a, a lot of doubt and, and suspicion surrounding Richard Reese. And in September, which is about five months after Elizabeth's abduction, he has a brain hemorrhage and he dies in prison. Completely unexpectedly, 
And this creates a real challenge because the police are somewhat positioning his death as though, you know, the the mystery of Elizabeth's abduction may have died with Reese. And so the family has to make a very concerted effort to show condolences to the Reese family and not come off as as being insincere. And in the same vein, pointing out that even if Reese was involved, he didn't act alone. And, and at that point, offered some rewards for information, one about, you know, if anyone could explain what had happened at Elizabeth's cousin's house on July 24th, and, and a couple of other questions that they offered rewards for around that time anonymously and, and didn't receive any credible tips from it. You write that without a new development, of finding Elizabeth seems hopeless. So let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for this message from our sponsor. Right now, are you aware that it can take up to 11 weeks for a business to hire for an open position? 11 weeks? If you're a growing business that's ready to hire, do you really need to wait that long? Well, if you're listening today, I've got some advice for you. Stop waiting and start using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter can help you find qualified candidates for all your roles fast. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology connects you with the right people for your specific roles. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So speed up your hiring process with ZipRecruiter. See why 3.3 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, Chris, we were talking about the, it seemed that there needed to be some new development in this case. And you then take us to the Mayflower Hotel, and the Smart family travels to New York City and to meet John Walsh and America's Most Wanted, the host, John Walsh. Tell us how this happens and what happens as a result. So there, there's a couple of things here that happen. So they, they do, they go to New York, they do their, their first network interview, and, and this is around the time of Reese's death. And then, and then shortly thereafter, a couple of weeks later, Mary Catherine Smart, Elizabeth's sister, who was in the room the night that she was abducted, she had feigned sleep. It was pretty dark. She didn't get a good look at the individual, but she recognized his voice. And, and one night, you know, the family had been told too throughout, don't ask her questions. If she wants to talk about it, talk about it, let her talk about it. But if you allow her to process it. At some point, she may figure out who it is. And this happened one night, she was reading the Guinness Book of World Records and saw a picture of the world's strongest woman. And it popped into her head that that voice was this man named Emmanuel who had worked in the yard one afternoon. He'd only been there one day. And she went to her father and said, Dad, I know, I remember who did. I remember who was in the room. I know who took Elizabeth. And they got pretty excited and, and called law enforcement. And law enforcement was less interested in the development. They over, you know, this created tension. A fair amount of the book deals with this tension between law enforcement and between Ed and Lois Smart on, on what to do. Law enforcement does not want the information coming out. And Ed and Lois Smart are at odds. Their, their extended families are at odds regarding what to do. The, the extended Smart family feels like they should defile law enforcement and come forward with the information. And the other side believes that they should trust this authority and do what the police are saying. And, and, and this goes on for several months before they, they finally make a decision on what to do. What is the police justification for not going along with a sketch? What is their rationale for that? You know, I couldn't really speak for the police department. So what I would be saying is, is somewhat speculation. It goes back to in, in, in law enforcement, there tends to be a lot of tribalism. And I think in this case, there was a herd mentality where most of the people in law enforcement felt that it was Richard Reese, that it was a slam dunk, that he had done it, and that they were wasting their time with anything else. They also had been under incredible scrutiny from the media, from the public, from the mayor's office. And I think they wanted to avoid any additional items that, that could reignite that. So what happens in terms of this continued police focus on this Reese and the family? as you say, increasingly at odds with the police to do something with this sketch that is, has been produced, but the police are 
pretty lax in, in the production of that sketch, to say the least. Yeah. So there's a lot of back and forth between the families. And finally, Tom Smart is the one who makes the recommendation that Ed and Lois should talk to John Walsh and agree ahead of time that whatever John Walsh says to do, that they will follow it. And they agree to do that. And they had met John earlier at the end of the summer and and had done his daytime talk show. And they had been invited back in early December to do his year-end show. He brought back his best guests. And I reached out to John and, and I'd worked with him a fair amount. So we had a relationship. And I explained to him that the smarts had a, that there was a development that they wanted to talk to him about and get his objective counsel that they needed him to, you know, I needed him to remove his journalist hat and to be, you know, to keep things completely confidential. And, and, and he agreed. And, and so we, we, we went and did the show and afterwards talked to John and, and John nearly jumped out of his seat when he heard the development that Mary Catherine had remembered and said, you guys need to come forward with this, that this is one of the most important developments in the case. And he cited probably a dozen other cases that had been solved where there had been mistakes by the police department that America's Most Wanted had become involved in. And we were always careful not to give new developments exclusively to any one media organization. And, and we, I talked to John about that. And I said, we're, we'll give you some preferential treatment, but we want to do a press conference in, in early January to announce this, you know, if you want to put together a package before that, we can work on something like that. And John said, Let, let's talk after the first of the year. And what happens on Larry King Live? Again, Larry King Live has devoted a incredible amount of time and, well, and resources, but focus on the Elizabeth Smart case. What happens with John Walsh, the information that you thought was confidential? Yeah, so on the, the 23rd of December, and then to back up a little bit, the Christmas holiday was incredibly difficult for the Smart family. They could not fathom sure. going through Christmas without their daughter. And it was a very somber time for them. And, and I had largely said, let me, I'll handle, you know, whatever's happening. Just, just take care of your family. Don't worry about it. I'll let you know if something big arises. Well, on the 23rd of December, I get a call from Tom Smart. I wasn't watching, but John Walsh was on Larry King Live and he had just leaked everything about Mary Catherine's epiphany. So the story yeah. came out on Larry King Live. Luckily, because of the holidays, I didn't receive any calls until the, the next day, about 10 o'clock the next morning. And then the floodgates opened and I spent Christmas Eve on my front lawn doing interviews. And, and the way we handled that was we said that there was credibility to what John was saying. And at the same time, the family wasn't ready to make that announcement. They would do that early in the new year. Uh, law enforcement immediately discredited what John was saying. They said he was doing it to promote his own TV show, that they had investigated this guy, that there was nothing to it, and that you know he was just blowing hot air. How does the other, the rest of the media respond to this, uh, even though it's on Larry King Live? Locally, it gets a little national. Locally, it gets quite a bit of attention. It, it does get coverage. Um, and, and they give, it's pretty balanced. It, it gets both sides. It gets the side of what uh, John's saying, that it's my quote saying that there's credibility to it. And then the police saying there's no credibility to it. So you say it's a bitter pill to swallow for you with this betrayal by John Walsh, but still the fact remains that you want to have this information that Mary Catherine has brought forward in terms of uh, the sketch and description. So how do you get this to happen? What happens in terms of your decision to what to do next? So I, yeah, I was very disappointed that that came out from John. You know, Ed shared my frustration at the same time John had been such an ally to the family. It, it was hard to be mad at him. He's such an incredibly nice guy. In, in hindsight, later on, there's members of, of the board, kind of the extended family who believe that had John not leaked that information, it's possible that the smarts might not have come forward with it. There were a number of, of things that occurred. Law enforcement, as, as the smarts were getting closer to defile them, continued to put more pressure on. They, they pulled Ed and Lois and me into a meeting one day and said, look, we, we want to reason with you. We found bullet casings in Richard Reese's Jeep, and we're relatively confident that he took Elizabeth out to the desert. He shot her. He's buried her somewhere. We may wow. never find her. We're doing our best, but we want to we want to level with you. And and if you guys come forward with this information, it's gonna it's gonna cause all kinds of issues, and it potentially could embarrass Mary Catherine. And we want to protect her. And so they were making this this case, and it kept delaying things. And finally, Ed Smart decided I'm coming out with it. 
We're doing it. And on February 5th, we called a press conference. And in the press conference, we offered a $10,000 reward for anyone who could exonerate Richard Reese, and then released a sketch of this man, Emmanuel, who had worked on the house for one day. And local media covered it. Ed and I jumped on a plane and went to New York. I had lined up interviews with the morning shows. And that next morning, all of the, the shows canceled. And it was odd. And so I called a source with one of the networks and asked him what was going on. And he said, the police department had made it very clear to the media that they should be careful on this one, that, that I had concocted the story to try to get Elizabeth back in the news and that they had investigated this guy and found nothing that led them to believe that he was any more prominent a suspect than anybody else. And so the national media completely panned the story. Locally, the story was about the reward, not the fact that there was, you know, that Kim Mary Catherine had remembered this guy that was potentially involved in the abduction. And so it was, it was really ignored. And, and at that point, you know, John, who had been the goat for a little while, came out as the hero. He was the only one who really took the story seriously and did significant feature on, on America's Most Wanted, which led to Brian David Mitchell's family stepping forward and saying, this is his name and he's capable of this and we need to find him. And there were two other stories in the next two weeks on America's Most Wanted before Elizabeth was recognized by America's Most Wanted viewers and was rescued. Yeah, it's incredible. You described a person that you were playing basketball, one of the your favorite hobbies growing up and still, I imagine. You talk about a Jason Burnett, somebody you played high school basketball with. You gave him a call. He wasn't answering. Tell us about this very dramatic scene that you read about. Yeah, so that day on March 12th, kind of a difficult start to the day, Tom Smart had blasted law enforcement to the Salt Lake Tribune. And, and over the prior nine and a half months, We'd been so measured and so disciplined in how we talked about law enforcement to, to not be overtly critical of them. We recognized that they were still the family's, one of the family's best tools for finding Elizabeth and, and also recognized that getting into shouting match with law enforcement was only going to create conflict and drama and it wasn't going to serve any good purpose. But Tom finally defiled that and nine and a half months of frustration came out and the Salt Lake Tribune publishes a front page story about the family finally criticizing law enforcement, which creates all kinds of national attention. The New York Times, USA Today, NBC News, everybody wants to talk now all of a sudden, despite the fact that a few weeks earlier, they had no interest in, in this development. And so we had planned a, a press briefing for that afternoon and, and Tom Smart and Ed Smart and I were getting together to determine how best to navigate that situation. And a few minutes before the meeting, Ed called me and told me that he had been summoned to the Sandy City Police Department, Sandy being a suburb 10 miles to the south of Salt Lake. He was told not to stop, not to talk to anyone, not even Lois. He felt like he needed to call me because he was going to be late to the meeting. He might even miss the meeting. And I told him to, you know, let me know when you know something. But as you mentioned, that my good friend, Jason Burnett, my basketball teammate, threw me the assist of a lifetime when I called him. And he finally picked up and he told me that the police department had brought in an indigent teenager that they believed was Elizabeth Smart. And I paused and tried to keep my composure. I was, I was crying and, and said to Jason, where did they find the body? And he said, what body? She's in the room next to me. And it was the most unbelievable news I had ever heard. We know the end of that story, but at that, in that moment, it was surreal. And, and I was able to get a hold of Ed Smart. And then we had a resolution plan and Tom and I started calling down to the other members of the extended family and the board and 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 giving them instructions on on what to do and and it was about 45 minutes later that the the story finally hit the news but it was it was the assist of a lifetime that's an understatement let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages now you chronicle this incredible moment when again we already mentioned at the beginning of this interview when you first laid eyes on her at that police station in the shabbily dressed and much different after a few days of nutrition and proper sleep and rest. But you also did see her less than 12 hours later at the home, and then which began this extraordinary relationship that still exists today. You've been an employee of, of the Smart family. You talk about the, the White House meeting in the Rose Garden. 
But let's talk about the National Amber Alert, one of the main things that was always focus of the family and also yourself. Yeah, the Amber Alert was a godsend. And and it really, you know, a lot of people recognize Elizabeth and, and the amazing work she does in taking something that's so tragic and, and using it as a catalyst to help other people and to be a force for good. And her father really started that with the Amber Alert. He was at a point where he was restless. The media attention was waning. And, and I reached out to Utah's congressional delegation and, and Senator Orrin Hatch's office suggested that we get involved with lobbying for, for the Amber Alert. And Ed it was a perfect fit. He was as passionate about it as anyone could be. We, we lobbied on Capitol Hill. We did countless interviews. And, and the nice thing about it was it gave us an opportunity every time we talked about it to also talk about, about Elizabeth and to keep her story alive, but in the, in the process to do something very positive. And, and shortly after Elizabeth was rescued, Ed really put the heat on and Elizabeth even wrote a letter to Congress. And, and a, a few weeks later, the, the National Amber Alert was passed. And, and it's, it's something that has, has stood as, as kind of a hallmark of that case, that it, it's been something that's now universal and, and has helped bring so many kids safely home. And you've worked and, and Elizabeth asked you to be involved with her. And again, uh, just tell us what this role was with this, this much different project than the rescue and search for Elizabeth. So at years later, I, I worked with Elizabeth during the trial. It was about a decade later that her um, abductors were were put on trial and then sentenced. And, and we looked at how do we take this opportunity where there was a lot of attention and, and use that to put out a message about other survivors and other victims of child abduction and sexual abuse and worked with something that Elizabeth is such a, a, a shy and modest person. She didn't want it to be about her. And so this gave her something else of substance to talk about. And she's like, I want to do this. Can I do more of this? And it's, you know, you have a tremendous opportunity to, to be an advocate. And so we started working together and figuring out, and she had a lot of opportunities. A lot of people played a role in this, but really figured out how to position her in the best way possible so that she could make a difference and, and, and be a voice for the voiceless. You write in the introduction that members of the church, if I don't have this incorrect, there's a, there's a reason why you took so long to be able to write this book. And there's a reason why it is so important to include your upbringing and the lessons that you learned by growing up in the culture of the Latter-day Saints Church. Tell us a little bit about these connections and the relations to this story and uh, your upbringing. Sure. So I worked, as I was writing the book, I was part of a group of writers from around the country who had no connections to Utah, no connections to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And as I was reviewing some initial material, they really pushed me. My, my culture to me is passe. And they kept saying, well, wait, what is this? And explain that. We're not interested from a religious standpoint, but we're really interested in your culture. And, and your culture really plays an important role in this story. And, and, and so they pushed me a lot. And, and we're a great sounding board as somebody on the outside that could help talk about, about that culture. But I grew up in a culture that's very well organized, that, that's very disciplined, you know, in, in the, you know, the Mormon church is, is the common term it gone away from, but in, in the church, you know, even from the age of three or four years old, you start speaking to the, to the group. So you're, you're grown up, you grow up as a communicator, you grow up doing a lot of service. And, you know, many people choose to serve a full-time two-year mission, which I had the opportunity to do at the age of 19. And, and there were many experiences through that, that, that prepared me for the opportunity to work with the smarts. And then with the smarts, I mean, some interesting elements of that culture as well is that, you know, each congregation is, is geographical. So if you live in a certain area, you go to church with the same people in that area at the same time each week. And, and it, it creates, especially in Utah, it almost creates these small towns within a small town where everybody knows each other, everybody looks out for each other. And when there are needs and challenges, you know, the village really comes together to help. And that was a big part of the reason that the search for Elizabeth was organized so quickly and so efficiently. There were some outside groups that came in to help with that as well. But the culture itself, and, and there are many people who aren't in the church that are a part of this culture as well, that, that really lent to that search effort and, and, and lent to 
providing the providing to the needs of the family during that time. Yeah, it's, it's very it's fascinating to see the immediate response and the level of organization in this church that rallied around this family is extraordinary. And I have not read of anything of, of the sort in comparison. You know, and the interesting thing is, you know, the smarts lived in, in an area where, where people were more affluent, but this same structure is exists throughout the world. I had some friends who had an issue while they were on vacation in Hawaii and had some extenuating circumstances, and they were able to get a hold of the bishop, the leader of, of the local ward, and were, then they were able to come to their aid. And, and, and so there, there really is an amazing tradition that, that goes back to the early days of the church of, of people serving one another and, and really being there in times of need. And this, this was just a prime example of that. You also don't go into too much, but I think it is very important that you, and you do stress this, that, that despite what Brian David Mitchell contended in, say, interviews and what the media interpreted and conveyed in their reports, some form of connection, sort of an extremist religious connection that Mitchell had with the Latter-day Saints of the church. So you, you talk about polygamy and that issue and dispel any kind of notions that people might have. And that's a stereotype of, of my religion, polygamy, which was something that it was outlawed in the 1800s. There are fundamentalist groups that are not tied to the church, that very much are on the fringe, that practice polygamy. I, and I write in the book that I was asked one as a child uh, in Missouri, a, a gift shop uh, cashier asked me how many wives my parents had. And I, I, I'd never seen a polygamist growing up. <laughs> uh, I have since then, but I, growing up, I'd never seen one. Yeah. But there are all these stories. There are lots of Netflix docuseries. There's books. There's other things written about these splinter groups out way well outside of the church and and a small fraction of them that, that there's these extremists the the herbal LeBarons, the Warren Jeffs the Brian David Mitchells that use religion as a leverage to get what they want Elizabeth in her book said that Brian David Mitchell didn't care about religion all he cared about was sex and alcohol in that order uh and and, and, and so it's something that is is misportrayed a lot uh specific to the current Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, and so it was something that that I did want to address and, and, and dispel a little bit. Not that there, are, there aren't issues in places and not that there aren't some issues with these splinter groups, but it's such a small percentage and it's unfortunate that it taints a, a group of, of good God-fearing people that, that are doing amazing things uh, in our community and in society. We didn't talk about, and we didn't talk about this in the beginning, but I think it's important Tell us about the genesis of this book, because originally you were writing about your next door neighbor, the damaged war vet and the relationship that you had and all you learned from that relationship. But tell us how it plays into the genesis of this book, Unexpected. I, I don't want to spoil it, but the last chapter is, is an experience that happened at a celebration a couple of days after Elizabeth was rescued. And I encounter somebody who just ties everything back. It was as though my experience growing up with Baker Paxton had prepared me for that moment. It was one of the most miraculous moments outside of Elizabeth's rescue and meeting her for the first time. It brings those two stories together. I've heard from a number of people who've read the book that initially they're like, wait, what is this backstory? Like, I just want to read about the smarts. Mm -hmm. And and over time, they hooked by it. And they all of a sudden are, are, are wanting to see where that one goes as well, and then, and then just amazed how they come together in the very end. Can you say that, uh, that there's the role of the values that you learned growing up in the church speak to the kinds of things like forgiveness and understanding, which led to being able to successfully manage the kind of eccentric and at times out of control characters of people like Tom Smart and other people in the media themselves that had their own agendas? Absolutely. And I think today we, we have, we're just so quick to judge people and especially people going through extenuating circumstances. And, and it's often when these people need our help the most that we are the most critical of them. And, and those experiences growing up helped me to uh, hopefully be a little bit more understanding and charitable and to have a little more patience in those circumstances because it was, you know, if I snapped at the media, that wasn't going to reflect well on the smart family. And so how do you, how do you diplomatically handle that situation? How do you give somebody the benefit of the doubt while still being assertive and looking out for the best interest of your client? 
And so a lot of those lessons growing up really instilled that in me and prepared me for those experiences. And, and reflecting on it 20 years later has helped reassure that. I mean, I still struggle with it. It's not like I'm an expert at it. It reminds me. I'm all the time in my, often I'll meet somebody and in the back of my mind, I'll say Baker, you know, to remind me that this person is likely very different than how I'm judging them in the story I'm telling myself in the moment. Yes, absolutely. It's an extraordinary book. And I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking about Unexpected, the backstory of finding Elizabeth Smart and growing up in the culture of an American religion. Chris Thomas, can you tell us if people want to find out more information? Is there a website? Do you do any social media? Absolutely. So ChrisThomasConnects.com. And, and a really fun element of that, Dan, I think you find this interesting, is I went and pulled from about 12 chapters. I pulled the video. So Bill O'Reilly interview, for example. Uh, I have wow. excerpts from that interview, video of that interview. So you can actually go back and see that that corresponds with it. I have a number of pictures there, links to my social media. And, and so it, it trying to make it something that's, that's dynamic and, and multimedia in, in, in function. So I hope people will enjoy that. And you know the book's available just about everywhere, as well as on Audible. I voice the book. So if you're not wow. tired of my voice, you can hear it yeah. for nine and a half hours more. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's great news. And uh, it's great to hear that you're voicing your own uh, audio book as well. That's very, very interesting. And I, I think very much uh, warranted and also uh, appreciated. I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking about your book, Unexpected, the backstory of finding Elizabeth Smart and growing up in the culture of an American religion. Chris Thomas, you have a great evening. And thank you so much for this interview. You too, Dan. Thank you so much. Good night.